Well, welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort of CNBC here with Shantanu Narayan, CEO of Adobe. Shantanu, it is great to have you. John, it's great to be on your show as always. And <laughs> Shantanu, everybody, is um, one of the first executives I met in Silicon Valley. Way back in the year 2000, I was a pretty young reporter at the San Jose Mercury News and have been given Adobe as a company to cover. And John Warnock and Chuck Geschke invited the young reporter in to meet the two leaders who were going to take over from them, Bruce Chisholm and Shantanu Narayan. And uh, my goodness, um, what, what a journey and a story has been in the way you in particular have grown this company. But I want to start off, as I always do, Shantanu, asking about the toughest problem that you are working on today, whether that's with Adobe's business or just in leadership or whatever it happens to be. If I can cheat, uh, John, and have two of them, uh, maybe, sure. you know, I, I think one that we're, I wouldn't say a problem necessarily, but I'm always working on products and product roadmap. And, you know, we have a bunch of really exciting innovation. And so thinking about how we get that out, uh, especially in this environment to our customers, how we market it, how we deliver it, I would say that's something that's top of mind. And I think related and associated with that, John, it what's the future of work and how do we bring back our employees in a safe way? So they're related, but it's always about how do you deliver innovation to our customers and how do employees contribute to that? How are those things related? Early in the pandemic, when you and I talked on CNBC, you told me that it's harder to create brand new products and ideas when people are remote. It's different when it's a continuation of an existing idea and people are maybe working off relationships that they've already had. But when you're trying to build something new, that's especially hard. Is that, does that continue to be true? And what are you finding as at least things beginning are beginning to open up and people are beginning to be able to convene again? John, I still think that's true, and I stand by that, which is uh, the employees of the company, frankly, the entire tech industry, and you can argue the economy at large, we've all proved how resilient we are in the face of this pandemic in terms of working from home and continuing to drive the economy. Having said that, I think uh, I mentioned to you I was in the office three days a week uh, this week, and just being able to interact with people and getting energy off them and hopefully, you know, uh, learning a bunch and inspiring them. I think when you're trying to create new projects, you could do it completely remotely. But uh, I think the speed by which you do it, the alignment that you can create and the sort of ad hoc conversations. I mean, literally this week as I was in the office, I, I had my regular set of meetings, but probably 10 meetings that I would have had to schedule the ad hoc conversations. I think it just reflected to me how a combination of people getting together and engaging with people being able to, you know, have that quiet time, have the remote time to do it. I think that's the best uh, situation. And I, so I, I stand by existing projects are really easy to execute flawlessly, but incubating new things, there's nothing like getting people together in a room. Now, I want to know, especially because uh, you at Adobe have been working on experience cloud for so long, and that's exactly what this past year, almost year and a half of pandemic has really tested and strained is a business's ability to learn as quickly as possible from the data that not only customers are sharing as they interact, but as the employees are having that experience and things are happening within the company, how do you use data from without and from within to make things better? What's the challenge there as customers have said, boy, we really have this need, perhaps, I imagine, more intensely than we ever have for Adobe to respond? It's a great question, John, and I think for your audience. I mean, when uh, most people still know Adobe for everything that we've done associated with Photoshop or PDF, but as you point out, the experience cloud was this new business that we created that enabled people to say, how do I create a digital business? How do I engage directly with my customers? How do I get insight into what they are doing? And that business has really taken off because digital is a tailwind. And what we are learning, I think, from our customers is that uh, the entire aspect of segmenting the customers, uh, how do you acquire these customers? How do you make sure that you're engaging with these customers in a digital first way has become way more important. And we were fortunate in that 
because we had made our transition and we created this notion of what we call a data-driven operating model, which is how do you have this underlying data to your question about how customers are learning about you, how they're interacting with you, how often, and what's the repeat usage that happens. We were able to create both a playbook for that, uh, the ability to have dashboards for that, and certainly the technology stack through the experience cloud to enable customers to do that. The conversations with companies across every industry, and it probably started with the B2C industries, you know, travel and hospitality, retail, financial services, what I found is that that's now transitioning to industries like healthcare or government or what companies that traditionally viewed themselves as B2B companies. And so, you know, the sharing of ideas, what we are learning as we have done our own uh, transformation, what they are grappling with right now, the richness of those conversations, I think, has been incredibly exciting because not only are our products being used to accomplish that, but it actually gives us tremendous insight into other problems that if we solve, we can continue to deliver value to customers. And so those conversations are happening every single day. Uh, speaking of some of those interactions and data, tell me about this Walmart uh, partnership that you guys just announced where their e-commerce tools are gonna to be worked into Adobe Commerce and Magento. Um, the, the possibilities here for assisting businesses and delivering an experience kind of remind me of Shopify in some ways, but um, that, that's not how I had been thinking of Adobe's role and position and, and uh, ambitions. How should, I, how should I think about and understand what the end game is here? Well, as you know, we acquired Magento a few years ago, and the excitement around Magento was that whether you were a B2C company or a B2B company, whether you were a large enterprise or a small or medium enterprise, whether you were engaging in physical goods or electronic goods like reservations, uh, the need to complete that transaction, that last mile, Adobe had always done uh, you know, the aspects of making sure that uh, their presence, the website, the mobile app, were being done with Adobe technology. But you know, transacting that last mile so that businesses could complete it was critical. And that was the acquisition of Magento. I think as we have done the Adobe Digital Index, we've learned so much more about that entire space, which is, uh, unfortunately, the small and medium business segment was probably the segment, John, that suffered the most when the pandemic first uh, hit. And so their desire to get this website, to be able to transact with their customers and actually process the payment, to have a mobile app, the importance of that and the urgency of that increased. And part of the Magento magic was always the fact that uh, because it was an open source uh, technology, we were able to leverage an ecosystem, an ecosystem of developers who wanted to use it, uh, ecosystem of systems integrators who wanted to do it. And, who better than Walmart, frankly, given the franchise that they have and given the breadth that they have and their desire. So we were thrilled when they announced that, you know, they were going to be working with Adobe technology to enable people uh, to, you know, do this last mile of commerce, to engage directly with customers. To just give you one example, since 2018, I believe that the number of people who buy online but maybe go into a physical store to pick up uh, has probably doubled or close to triple. So I think, you know, the partnership with Walmart hopefully leverages uh, for us uh, their reach, their distribution, and their desire to, you know, enable more customers to do that. As you know, this was also on the heels of what we did with FedEx, uh, where FedEx has also said that they are working with Adobe so that they can do the, the actual, uh, you know, distribution uh, through the air network. So we, we were really pleased to be part of this announcement. These logistics and e-commerce tool sorts of partnerships or, you know, product developments are, again, the sort of thing that I'm used to seeing out of somebody like a Shopify or a big commerce. Is your um, intent or ambition or vision for Adobe to have something that's, um, I don't know whether to call it uh, WYSIWYG in that sense, comprehensive? in that kind of sense with all the different sorts of services and capabilities that you offer? 
I think there's some mega trends that are happening, John, that we want to be in front of. I mean, and when you mentioned WYSIWYG, you know, the term that comes to mind also is the low code, no code movement, which is how can somebody with just a few clicks, as you pointed out, create this e-commerce experience and get their uh, presence online. And I think it's fair to say that we probably focused a lot more on the medium to larger scale enterprises in terms of where the experience cloud was focused. And we recognize that uh, through these uh, partnerships, we have the ability to actually extend that to a much larger group. So I would look at that and say there are two mega trends in technology uh, that we need to make sure that we're at the forefront of. The first is you know, what we're doing with the API economy. And any technology that we have, if a developer you know, sitting anywhere in the world can get access to technology and maybe through a metering system, have the ability to incorporate it, try it out, and then we can scale it. So, you know, we want to be uh, responsive, frankly, and anticipating some of these technology trends. So I would say our go-to market will still focus a little bit more on the larger enterprise, but through these partnerships, if we can extend the breadth of our technology, PDF and sign is another great example, to a much broader set of customers that only helps us. And you know, maybe the last thing tongue in cheek I would say is as we know, every business starts at a zero billion dollar business revenue stream. And so every business wants to grow. And so we wanna play our part in enabling that. Well, uh, speaking of growth, I remember when I was covering you guys, uh, who knows how many years ago, more than 15, and you had your first billion dollar revenue year and what a milestone that was. You guys are now, you know, basically a $300 billion market cap company, which is amazing. But Adobe hasn't always been, and you haven't always been running Adobe. So now's the point where I want to do that thing and go way back and get the origin story, the Chantenu origin story particularly. And I like to start at the very beginning. So tell me, uh, like, where were you born? Tell me the household, parents, siblings. What was the situation? Well, I was born in, uh, you know, Bombay, India, and I grew up and I spent most of my early life in a city called Hyderabad in India. You know, Hyderabad has become quite a tech hub. And uh, what I would say, John, is my parents always instilled in me a, a real focus on learning, intellectual curiosity. My father ran his own business uh, in industrial plastics. My mother was a professor of American literature. Uh, you know, her PhD was in American literature and she taught in a university in Hyderabad, which is uh, the city I was, I was in. I, you know, I did all my undergrad there. I have one brother who also lives in the Bay Area. He was in, he's in chips. And so, uh, but you know, I think the dream in those days, the opportunities that exist today all around the world, the internet hadn't had the kind of impact. And so sort of the go west, young man was an important thing both my father and my uh, brother had come to the states to study and i wanted to come here for grad school which drew me to valley and you know uh, the opportunities that i've got just make me feel so blessed john so how did your mom end up focusing on american literature that's really interesting well uh, you know she loved uh, carl sandberg and don marcus and you know uh so i, I both my parents are so incredibly uh well read it's it, it's really uh, helped me so uh, so much and i think uh, one of her phd advisors actually also taught at an american university so there was probably some angle associated with that uh, but she taught english uh, all her life and her phd as i said was in american literature and you know it, I, maybe there was something it was a preordained thing john that you know she was going to also you know uh, pave the path for me to come to the states uh, so what are the first books or stories, um, American literature or not, that you remember uh, influencing you or falling in love with? I always loved, I, I, you know, I wanted to be a journalist. And I think, you know, maybe there was that part of, you know, my mother that was an inspiration to me. I, I think the two authors that probably uh, influenced me the most, uh, I mean, I, I grew up reading a lot. In my family, there was always time and money for books, uh, John. And so Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, you know, so the mystery, the intrigue, I think that's a genre that's always, uh, you know, excited me. And, and then the other one I would say was P.G. Wodehouse. And P.G. Wodehouse, uh, amazing uh, humor, 
And most importantly, I think what I learned from that was, you know, how every word that he chooses was appropriate. This was when, you know, you have to uh, do two tests to come to the United States. You know, you do your GRE, uh, which requires an English test. You do test of English as a foreign language. And, you know, I think growing up, I would read these. And when there was a word that I didn't understand, I would write it and look it up. And I, even though I, you know, I studied English all my life. And so, but Arthur Conan Doyle and P.T. Woodhouse, I also read a lot of the, I would say, more serious philosophy stuff. Uh, you know, I think you all go through a phase where you read that. But uh, I've come back to these two uh, genres as ones that I still love to, uh, still love to do. So I still read a lot of mystery. I still read a uh, you know, a bunch of comedy and, and humor and you know, some self-improvement books. <laughs> well, I, I can relate to that part about the dictionary. Um, my, my oldest, our oldest is 13 years old and he's kind of wanting to get into more mature literature. So I'm like, and, and horror movies. So I'm like, okay, well, let's read Stephen King together. Let's read it. And uh, I was like, well, get your dictionary um, because Stephen King is using a sort of language and, and you know, symbols and things that are a, a bit more uh, textured than he's used to. So we're definitely still doing that. And what do you remember outside of maybe the academic stuff and even the reading being into um, as a young person growing up? What, what hobbies or sports or anything like that were you focused on? I, just on that note, very quickly, there was a book that I read at, you know, yeah. the, uh, 30, 40 years ago, How to Build a Better better vocabulary. So I don't even know if a version of that book still exists, but a lot of, uh, you know, gratitude towards uh, having that book as I was uh, going through my journey. You know, growing up, uh, John, I mean, I, I went to this incredible school that has been written up about in Hyderabad called Hyderabad Public School. And it was all about an all-round education. In fact, academics was just a really small part of it. And so, you know, uh, my interests were varied. Uh, cricket is a religion in India. So if you grow up in India, you know, you follow cricket unbelievably passionately. But I participated in a lot of extracurricular activities. I was the editor of the school magazine. I participated in quizzes and debates. I played tennis. I was on the college uh, and high school tennis team, uh, you know, and I, table tennis. And I did all of that stuff. Actually, in college, I sailed competitively for India in an Asian's which is sort of the pre, uh, you know, it's the baby version of the Olympics, maybe is a one way of putting it. So I actually did a lot of stuff, but academics. And, you know, I, at some point, I think I was a late bloomer as it related to academics. But the all-round education, I think, really helped me. Uh, and it was a great, great experience growing up in India. Why so many things? Um, was there... Is that a reflection of the curiosity, the the kid who was interested in mystery and what's around the next corner? I mean, I know I, I was interested in a lot of things too, but you know, some people focus in on one thing and here's what I've been assigned and here's what I'm going to do, and some other people, you know, are are wanting to try a lot of different things. What why why was that for you? I'm not sure I can answer that. Maybe anything that would keep me away from hitting the books, John, and you know, <laughs> and what my parents would say. Okay, this is a new thing, and so let him explore, and you know, the uh, sort of support for me to explore. Uh, but maybe you know, I, in retrospect, it was just I was so fortunate. I mean, you know, so many people today. That's why we're so passionate as a company and a family about digital literacy and giving people the opportunity. I think part of it was my parents really wanted me uh, to explore and I wanted to explore and the school enabled that to explore. And, uh, you know, you eventually focus. And at some point I realized I wanted to do, uh, you know, journalism was perhaps not what I was going to pursue. So I wanted to do engineering and you narrow it down. But I, you know, if I take a step back and I see what's so brilliant about the American education system, it is this ability to, you know, try out different things before you really understand. Otherwise, way too much in India, at least in those days, you would be put in a path without really understanding if it was the right thing for you. I mean, to give you an example, when I did engineering in India, undergrad, out of the whatever four years that I studied, I probably had the ability to have two electives, which were not either math, physics, chemistry, or electronics engineering, which is the precursor to computer science, which is what I studied. And so, I, you know, I, I think people should explore and it, you know, fires different neurons right in your brain, which I think some way later, you know, whether it's 
looking at patterns or empathy, they, they all build up. Uh, and so I, I, but short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an important message that you're giving there, uh, really about the liberal arts education, because it's kind of falling out of favor. I mean, there are more and more um, both universities and parents, I think, that are being financially incentivized to say, oh, well, you ought to be on this path going in, and I want to know that my kid or that I am going to have a job coming out of college. And while that is important, you know, the, the exploration, I worry, could get lost. And it seems like at Adobe, you're looking for people certainly with the chops to do engineering work for a lot of what you do, but also some of that empathy and perspective you're talking about. I think so, John. And, uh, you know, rather than narrow, I think striving for excellence in whatever you wanted to do. So I think the one thing perhaps is that, you know, my two boys uh, have also had the great fortune. They both grew up in California of going to great schools. And I think what was important for us was explore it, but explore it with an intent to either learn or to get good at stuff. And I think, you know, if you approach that with that, as it comes back to Adobe, I mean, we have the gamut, right, of what makes good design and how do you learn about things in marketing and what's appropriate in terms of business model innovation and products. So I think even great companies really learn so much uh, through, you know, the diverse viewpoints and the ability for those diverse viewpoints to come together and, and geographic uh, distribution. So I'm a big believer uh, that, you know, irrespective of what your undergrad education is, if you can demonstrate passion and if you can demonstrate a commitment to, you know, uh, what a company's mission is, you're probably going to have a great career at Adobe. And, and that, you know, I, you look at the number of great companies that were started by people who didn't even complete their education, uh, you know, conceptually. It, it was all about that passion. And so that's really what we look for uh, at Adobe. And that's what I look for. So um, we, we talked a bit about. Uh, you finding your way. Clearly, you focused in on engineering, did well at it, went to a good school. How did you end up deciding to come to the U.S.? What was the, the impetus there in that first job? I, I, I want to clarify, actually. I, I, academically, uh, where I really did well was after coming to the U.S. And so, okay. you know, when I did my I did my master's in computer science, a small school in Ohio, then I did do an MBA at Berkeley. And uh, again, because my brother and my father had done, uh, you know, come to the States, I, it's actually, I, I'll give you a statistic. Uh, my elder brother is three years older than me. I think 90% or, and he went to IIT, which is one of the best uh, Indian colleges, 80 to 90% of his graduating classes in the States. My graduating class, uh, uh, probably 50 to 60% of my graduating classes in the States. Today, because of the opportunities that exist, 5% of graduating class from, you know, the Indian institutions come here. Wow. And while that's good for India, you know, from a competitive perspective for the US, we're not always able to attract, you know, the number of people that happens. And so for me, it was pretty clear. I wanted to go to a graduate degree. My undergrad degree was actually in electronics, uh, John, which was, you know, capacitors and inductors. And, uh, you know, I fell in love with microprocessors in my uh, final uh, years. And so I knew I wanted to switch to computer science rather than stay in electronics engineering. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to get an assistantship to do it. But coming west, I think was at least in my household, considered one of those things that you have to do, uh, mm -hmm. because it opens up vistas. And, and then, my brother was in the valley. He was working at that point for a chip company. And so I came and stayed with him, found a job and never left. Um, what was the job you found? What was your impression of the valley when you first got there? I, I loved it. I actually came in 1984. Uh, and it's ironic we're talking about it today. But it was the Olympics. The Olympics were going on in Los Angeles. And so, you know, I, I, I actually flew directly uh, to, the, uh, to uh, California. 101 was the first freeway I was in. And because my brother was working, I would actually uh, watch the Olympics during the day. I spent a week here before I went to school. And I, you know, I was immediately blown away. I mean, uh, it, it just was everything that you dream of as an immigrant. And it was that and more, John. And so, uh, and, you know, my brother, uh, who has had a massive influence in my life, he knew my tendency to maybe do a whole bunch of things. 
he actually told me that if I didn't get straight A's in grad school, I might get deported. And so I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to focus on studies because I don't want to get deported and, you know, uh, bring disrepute repute to my family. And so I studied really hard, uh, you know, in grad school. <laughs> well, way to go, your brother. I remember the 84 Olympics. Carl Lewis, uh, I remember where I was that summer and, you know, trying to run really fast. Um, when did Adobe come into the picture for you? And I mean, clearly your interest shifted from semiconductors <laughs> to, to something else uh, eventually. I, I worked just before, I, I mean, I was fortunate. I worked for some great tech companies. You know, my first job was MeasureX Automation Systems, but mm. I worked for Apple for six years. I worked for Silicon Graphics, you know, when Silicon Graphics was flying high, you know, uh, that was uh, sort of the whole dinosaur uh, sort of, uh, you know, thing. But in 95, John, I started a company with two other uh, co-founders from Silicon Graphics. Uh, the company was called Pictra. We raised a lot of money. And the idea behind Pictra was we said, uh, this was just when analog photography was transitioning to digital photography. And so we're like, we think that the innate need and desire for people to share pictures digitally is going to be big. And, you know, uh, so he's like, why don't we create a website for sharing images? This was in 95. And, you know, allow people, if they drop off their roll of film, to digitize it. And so we wanted to capitalize on the trend towards digital photography. And we wanted to, you know, create a, a website, a community in those days. And clearly, I, you can argue we were a little ahead of our time. The business model was not as uh, sophisticated. The technology was early. And, you know, we approached Adobe in terms of a partnership and uh, we actually shipped some of our soft software with Photo Deluxe at that point. Uh, and I realized around, you know, in a couple of years that while the company's ideas were good, this was Pictra, that it was unlikely that it would be a thriving concern. And so uh, at that point, uh, Ross Bart, who ran all engineering uh, for uh, Adobe, and I had worked together at Silicon Graphics, I had done the partnership with Bruce on Photo Deluxe and both of them said, hey, why don't you come to Adobe? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm interested in imaging and this is the Photoshop company and you know what could be better than working for the gold standard? And so uh, that's when I came to Adobe in 98. What's amazing about that to me is that um, sometimes we tend to segment in our minds that there are management of big company CEOs and there are founder entrepreneur CEOs. You worked, you, you were an entrepreneur and you started Pictra and then you worked within Adobe in management for so long and when you became CEO, you, um, I think it's fair to say, uh, sort of relaunched Adobe into a new era. Not that Adobe fundamentally changed or needed a turnaround in particular, but Adobe was a prosumer company, not an enterprise software company, and not nearly with the scope that it has right now. So there are, there are a few CEOs that I've covered over the years who have taken a company that, you know, not a bad company, but taken it to new heights that's almost like a, a reinvention. Why didn't you leave and start your own company if you had that seed within you and that spark within you that entire time? I, you know, I've thought about it, uh, honestly, John. And I, when I first came to Adobe, I probably thought that I'd be there for a year, year and a half, and then go off and start another company, honestly, uh, if I go back and look at it. But um, in 98, when I joined, in 99, the company hit a wall. Uh, you know, there was uh, uh, J Japan's economy had suffered, so the company suffered. You know, John Warnock and Chuck Geshe completely reorganized the company. And, you know, I'd come in as, you know, a general manager. They said, we're going to go completely functional. Uh, you will get a kick out of this. That was when InDesign, you know, was about to be launched. And they said, we want people, uh, you know, uh, to really focus on uh, technology. And they asked me to take on a technology role. So, I think and I mean, you mentioned InDesign. That was right after the great insult of Quark making a run at you guys, right? That's right. That's right. And, and that, that I, I still remember so vividly, John coming, uh, you know, and talking about how 
Adobe is going to win, much like we had done through all of the prior things. And then, as you know, uh, the rest is sort of history. But my point is, I, I learned so much and I was given so much opportunity. I mean, you start a new company because you want to be able to have impact and you want to be able to work with a team to create something magical. And I got all of that at Adobe. You know, my role changed so uh, drastically. Bruce gave me so much opportunity. Uh, John gave me so much opportunity. And so by 99, I joined in 98. By 99, I was running all engineering, John. And by 2001, I was running all products. And so, you know, just the opportunity that I had and to work with this team. And in some sense, maybe, you know, when you work for a company 20 years and you uh, are so, uh, you know, tied to what the company does and so motivated by what the company does, you don't tend to think of yourself as an outsider. And maybe that's the reason for my success. I mean, I view this as much as my baby. And I hope every employee at Adobe views, you know, the company as, as part of what they are helping make happen. And so, I, you know, I've never thought, I've never actually answered a phone call since I joined Adobe. There was no need to do it. A phone call from the headhunter? I, no, never. And I remember one thing that John said to me, uh, John Warnock said to me at one point, he said, if you don't like your job, this was when I became CEO, he said, you have one person to blame. And he clearly <laughs> meant, you know, I had myself to blame. And, and that stuck with me, right? I mean, I if I can recreate my job at the company and do things that excite me and have impact, what message am I sending to the other employees, right? And so I've loved every minute of it. So you say if you don't like your job, you have one person to blame. But if you don't like the times in which you find yourself having to do your job, maybe it's more complicated. So we, we kind of caught up in real time to the, the moments when you and I first met, 99, 2000, you're getting the big uh, assignment in 2001. That's also when the dot-com bust is happening. So you have a bit of a history of getting big assignments right before the rug gets pulled out from under like the, the, the macro economy. What kind of a challenge was that to have broader responsibility, but a tough environment? There's perhaps some part of my upbringing, uh, John, that sort of helps me through this, which is, you know, uh, maybe the Indian culture where you take a long-term view and, you know, there are things that you can, uh, you know, impact and there are other things that you cannot impact. So I think acceptance of the things that you cannot impact and, you know, focus on where you can actually have a material difference. And I, as you point out, whether it's in 2001 or when I took over in, as CEO in 2007 and then the recession hit in 2009 again. So, you know, maybe one thing I did not learn in business school was, you know, sort of when to take on these key assignments. <laughs> but, but if you look at it a different way, John, I mean, it's it's only upside from that point, right? And if something is happening to you, I think it's all about why would you let this crisis go to waste? And so I, I think, again, the team, I, I just cannot thank my team enough for when that 2009 recession hit the way the team rallied and said how do we use this as a you know motivating uh, way for us to completely reinvent the company and so and that's that's the part you remember maybe to your point when you're in it you know you can feel a little sorry for yourself or a victim but you know that only goes that far you only have yourself to blame again and so i think i've always taken the half full you know the optimist uh, view associated with it. And yeah, I, I still do that to this day because there are certain things that you cannot um, address. And so you might as well put them out of your head. Okay. Now I, I've been waiting to ask you this for years and years. You become CEO late 2007. There's so many things going on, especially, you know, iPod, iPhone, you know, there's hardware, um, th there's ideas about like remote printing and mobile, this and that. There's so many directions that you could have taken Adobe into at the time. And Adobe was making a whole lot of money off of packaged software. You're selling Photoshop on a, you know, couple year cycle for 500 plus dollars a box. And you decide to be a pioneer in software as a service and cloud, which is completely unproven at the time. Adobe is the pioneer in not only figuring this out, but growing a business on top of it. How on earth 
did you come up with the model and kind of bet the company on this concept that so many people thought wouldn't work? It wasn't one, you know, isolated instance. I think there were a whole bunch of things that contributed. And I think this is what companies should realize, John, which is there's a lot of data and signals. The question is, are companies going to, uh, you know, be in denial of those symptoms or are companies going to accept them? And I, this is where, again, I give, you know, the founders so much credit uh, for John and Chuck always saying, you know, I, in my words, software as an S-curve. And if you're not always thinking about what the next S-curve is, you're unlikely to thrive in the future. I think around that time, there were a couple of things that were probably the, the real key drivers for that. The first is, you know, the mobile devices, to your point, had just started to come out. The cloud was starting to explode. And we were this traditional 12 or 18 month product cycle. Uh, and when you talk to the product people, they felt like, you know, we were really not allowing them to innovate at the pace at which they wanted to innovate. Because, and I say this, uh, you know, financial accounting standards, bodies, rules, FASB rules about how we recognize revenue in a box software precluded us from innovating at the pace at which developers can innovate. And, you know, if you're ever in a company where you look at it and say, oh my God, the product people aren't able to do the kind of innovation at the pace at which they want it, you're doing something wrong. So that was a big driver. I think a second big driver as part of the recession when we heard was that our recurring revenue was 5%. And when your recurring, recurring revenue is 5% and you have a recession and your revenues drop precipitously, what's the only thing you can do to improve profits? You let people go. And I've, I've always said to myself, if you let people go once, as a result of you know, a macroeconomic massive change, it's understandable. If you use that as a excuse every year for letting people go, it's management's problem. And so we really needed to get to a point where we were not so dependent on recurring revenue. And you know, I, there are multiple such stories like this, but the message was there. And you know, when people ask me the question of what gave you the courage, Frankly, with the team that we had, it would have taken courage for me not to do it. And, you know, when we went to the board, we were so unified, associated but, with it. But there were so many companies that were in a similar position that didn't do it that early. Um, you know, I, I've talked to the former CEO of Intuit, who, you know, I know you talked to about how you did what you did, tried to follow in your footsteps, but sort of needed to make some changes to make it work. I mean, there were so many packaged software companies that were selling to small business at you know a, a big price for the box with the DVDs, but you moved first. What what was there a team that you pulled together to figure out how that was going to work to talk through the mechanics of whether broadband was ready and what the risks were? How did that work? Well, there were two things that I would point to. The first is we actually uh, why we knew where our north star was, John we actually straddled both it for a little while because we also recognize that some of our customers might take a little time to you know transition from one model to another so when we first announced the cloud uh, we weren't hedging our bets but we said that we would ship boxes as well as subscription for a little while to help people with the transition i think in certain countries like in australia we burned the boats a little bit quicker where we said you know what we feel like we can switch over quickly so I think what perhaps doesn't get uh, recognized as much people talk about the move to the cloud, the execution associated with it, right? I mean, a lot of CEOs who have mentored me will tell me, you know, the strategy is sometimes the easy thing. It's the strategy without execution. And the team executed flawlessly, the finance team and what they had to do to model this and what would be accretive, you know, the customer support team, because now you had to be a seven by 24, the operations team. So I think the execution gets a little underplayed, honestly, uh, John. And it's every single employee who knew what they had to do to make this happen. The product teams who are like, OK, now anytime I release a piece of software, it has to be compatible, which was, you know, in those days, if you remember when box software came, every version was completely incap incompatible with the other ones. And they had to figure out how you innovate by making things forward compatible. And so. I think the execution part, as we got so much confidence, we had the germ of an idea, 
We tried it out. We kept both of them in parallel. But at some point, we also realized we would get overwhelmed by trying to do both. And maybe this was the other lesson. If you want to focus as a company, you just have to make uh, a certain, I, I don't like the word bet. I don't like the word risk, uh, John. I like the word investment. We had okay. to make an investment and some of them work and some of them don't. And you have to be comfortable with it. And maybe that was the other part. We were comfortable. If we were dead wrong, we would switch. What's the difference? You'd probably, you'd probably difference? be interviewing somebody else instead of me if that happened, but we would have switched. What's the difference between a bet and an investment? I, you know, I, I, I think... The di real distinction I'm trying to draw is between a risk and a bet and an investment. Okay. I, I, I think the risk is when the risk somehow seems irresponsible if you say we took a risk. The investment says, you know, we had this hypothesis, we had good assertions, we had good data, clearly we hadn't connected the dots, and we were going to make that investment. If that investment paid out, we would double down. If the investment did not pay down, and that's how we think about the company even now. I mean, we yeah. have to change. We have to evolve. We have to make investments. So are your assertions clear? Are your hypotheses clear? Do you have you know, data that suggests that that would be the right thing? Not all the data, because if you wait for all the data, you're too late. And then you've got to go try and iterate, right? And so that's the distinction. It was more associated with risk versus investment that I like to talk about it. No, that, that makes sense. This isn't roulette, you're saying, which is yes. which is a game of chance. Yeah. You, you can do research and have a hypothesis drawn from that and understand that everything's not going to work, but move yeah. forward with confidence because of the way you, you're making your decision is, is what you seem to be saying. And it's okay to say, you know what? It didn't pan out, and therefore, you know, we're going to go back to what was there, and we would have if that did. But the early feedback was so positive. People were like, wow, new devices are coming out with new. Remember when the Mac came out with Retina Display and Photoshop supported Retina Display a week later instead of, you know, waiting for years. And people are like, this has benefits, a new Canon camera. You know, that was great. The DSLR revolution was happening. So, you know, we had to get the new evangelists of customers who are using us. I mean, I, I still love it, what we do, uh, John. We, you know, we're doing speech to text captioning. And I saw, you know, you're tweeting about how you're using that in Premiere Pro and, yeah. you know, what you have to do. So I think it's, it's feedback like that from forward-looking people who want to innovate and give us positive feedback. That gives you so much courage and confidence. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to do an Adobe commercial, but these are my toys Shantanu, that you're making, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to edit together, you know, best of concise Fort Knox stuff. And, you know, I've had feedback from you know, deaf viewers who are saying, hey, this captioning is really important. Can you caption your videos? And I want to be able to do it, but I got all this other stuff to do. When you can save me time and let me caption, man, that's for a, for a creator, that's huge. So I, I, I will say that. I, I'm an, an early user uh, of that feature in Premiere Pro and a power user of much of Adobe Cloud. So um, I, I like to ask about what I call Death Valley. And that refers to a, a lowest point um, because I think there's so much to learn from it. W was there a time in your journey um, as an engineer, uh, as an executive, when you hit a wall and thought that everything that you had planned, what you envisioned, just might not work out and you might have to do things completely differently? I think of all the you know low points, uh, and I like to think I bounce back pretty quickly, I think it's when you let people go in a recession and you know what happened in 2009, I had just taken over as CEO. You know, you uh, believe certainly that you have the responsibility of growing people's careers and their families' lives are dependent on how the company does. And I think that's one of those uh, you know, times that really shook me up because it wasn't anything that the employees had done. And so I think, and, and that also taught me that we have to assume responsibility. And you know, if there are times, we have to take the longer term view. But of all, all the times, I, I like to remember the more optimistic, uh, you know, the happier times. I like to learn from the things that I did wrong. Uh, yeah. I would say that was that was probably one of the low points. Now that, that sounds to me like part of what you were saying about the impetus to invest in cloud and build out that strategy. So you mentioned it as 
a low point, and you said before, when you have to do something like that, you only want to have to do it once because if you have to do it again, it's a failure of management and vision. Was that low point for you part of the inspiration to explore the, the cloud strategy more fully? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And, you know, I'm fortunate in that, uh, you know, many members of that original team, we went on an offsite, you know, and we talked about what was happening and how we needed to focus. But uh, without a doubt, I mean, it's so much easier when your back is against the wall, uh, you know, or, or you've had one of those low points to make change. I think the unending quest, John, is how do you make that change? when you have uh, you know the wind in your sails but that was definitely one of the you know motivations to say we can let ourselves again be in this kind of position so let's plan for it let's be deliberate and thoughtful and let's go execute and so i often find that whatever it is that brings people through that death valley experience whatever lesson, uh, whatever tool that, that you end up using becomes a tool in your toolbox that you continue to use as a leader after that. Was that the case for you? And what would you say is the core belief you gained from that experience, if so? I, it was definitely one of those seminal moments for us. I think the positive seminal moments are when you make a, a move like you know, acquiring Omniture or the macromedia integration where you say, this is a, you know, a, a positive thing. I think what I learned is that, you know, it's still so true today. The power of the team and how we aligned and rallied around that, John, is something that is truly amazing. I think CEOs get way too much credit, uh, you know, for what they do because it's the team. And, I, you know, I think just listening, you know, there were people in the organization who had those ideas. I mean, they'd grown up in the subscription economy. They wanted to do stuff. And so I think how you harness the power of the individuals and yet you are uh, you have a strong point of view about where you want to go. But the power of a team, the power of a team, we're not the company that we would be without contributions from the thousands of employees that we have. Let, let me ask you about Adobe's culture. Um, th there's been a change in my observation in how Silicon Valley views what a good CEO looks like and acts like. But from the beginning, I think, uh, Adobe's founders were different in that um, th they didn't start off as punk college kids or dropouts and then mature. Like, <laughs> these were guys, these were grown-ups from the beginning. Um, and, you know, Chuck Geschke used to say that he and John never had a fight, really. Um, you have a leadership style that I'm seeing more often in newer successful CEOs in the Valley, but is sort of antithetical to the old um, in your face, uh, perhaps more brash approach that some other CEOs in tech have had. What's your perspective on why Adobe is as it is and how um, the kind of archetype of the tech leader might be changing? I don't think there's a one size fits all, uh, John, in that. And again, when I think about it, you're so right that Adobe had a certain absolutely unique culture that makes it the special place that it is. Uh, but it's not for everybody, right? Because people look for different things in a culture. And again, there, I feel like I'm so fortunate in that I, you know, people do their best work when they resonate with the mission of the company and the values of the company resonate with them as well. And so, um, I, I certainly uh, attribute to that low key, you know, let's do our best work and, you know, things speak for themselves. And, but that's not for everybody and that's not for every culture. So far from me to opine honestly on what others do. And I, I, I would say, I think, you know, when we tell employees what we stand for and who we are, uh, to some, hopefully that's incredibly appealing and they want to come here and do their best work. But for others, as long as you're transparent about who you are and who you're not or authentic, which I guess is the word that's used more often, I think it is changing though, John. And I think I struggle with some of these things. I mean, a lot of CEOs today opine on everything. And you've probably heard me opine on less things than most people. And, you know, I, I, I think part of it is our belief that we have to be thoughtful about where we opine and where we are like, you know what, the diverse views, even within the employee base. And, 
it's hard to disassociate when I say something. Is that the view of me as an individual or the view of the company? And and I'm perhaps a little bit, you know, less out there to your point because because of that belief that I have. And but there are downsides to it. So I'm I'm I, you know I as long as we're authentic to who we are and people know who you are. But as the company is growing as much as it is, I think the obligation to amplify what you are, even if it is to say we're going to be quiet, I think that importance has only increased. And it's only increased over again over the last couple of years between everything that's happened. And that's a changing thing that I, even you know the company has to evolve and I have to evolve. We remain true to our values, but we have to recognize that you know, the next generation of employees, the millennials who are joining us, their expectations are different. And so you have to change through the times, but I, different cultures and, and I'm okay with it. I'm just thrilled that I came to a company that, you know, uh, spoke to me. Well, I think even in the way you articulated that just now, you're sort of wrestling with it, which, uh, which perhaps doesn't a attempt to show a, a level of certainty. And I think that's, um, that's consistent. To me, it seems uh, part of authenticity is consistency. If you're going to be quiet, be consistently thoughtful and quiet because you'll get called out if sometimes you are and sometimes you're not. And it, it seems to me um, you're reflecting that. There you go. Um, yeah. Quiet and thoughtful in their response. Shantanu, it's been great. Uh, I appreciate the time that you've given talking about uh, Adobe and talking about your own journey. Thank you again so much, uh, John, for having me. It really is always a pleasure uh, you know, to be with your show. And as you point out, we've had a long uh, you know, uh, relationship over the years in which the company has uh, evolved. And I've always appreciated the thoughtfulness with which you uh, bring uh, your perspective to Adobe. So thank you. Uh, and thank you as well. Shantanu Ryan, Adobe CEO. This has been Fort Knox. See you again soon.